Thomasic's portfolio surges in 2022 and Singapore is now its top investment destination. Some 1.5 million Singaporeans will receive up to $700 in cash next month to help them cope with inflation. Posing for photos at the palace, Sri Lankans vow to stay put until the President and Prime Minister resign as promised. Welcome to The Big Story. I'm Harianto Diman. Subscribe to the Straits Times channel so you will not miss an episode. One of the most closely watched investors in the world, Singapore's Tamasic, has announced results for the last financial year. Its net portfolio surging to a new high of $403 billion as at the end of March. That is $22 billion more than a year ago. Tomasic's one-year total shareholder return coming in at 5.81%. That is in sharp contrast to the 24.53% return last year. By geography, Singapore has replaced China as Tomasic's top investment destination. Assets in Singapore now comprise 27% of its portfolio, up from 24%. And exposure to China has dropped to 22% from 27%. Joining us is Rohi Sipahi Malani, Tamasik's Chief Investment Officer and Head of Southeast Asia. Welcome to the show, sir. Uh, with one-year returns of 5.81% and portfolio values at a record high, what do you make of Tamasik's performance? Well, look, I would say uh, we were pleased with the resilience of our portfolio and what has been a volatile environment. Uh, having said that, uh, we don't look at our numbers and our performance from a year-by-year -year perspective because ultimately we are investors. We're constructing a portfolio for the long term. And so therefore, we really like to look at it from a 10 and 20 horizon. And in those time horizons, we've made 7% uh, in the last 10 years, 8% in the last 20 years, which is broadly in line with our cost of capital, uh, which is what we look to meet. Uh, and going forward, I would therefore say what has been important for us this year is that we've continued to reshape our portfolio to make sure it's resilient across different environments as we go through what will inevitably be a more volatile decade ahead of us. Uh, Rohit, let's talk about um, the country of exposure. Now, China at 22% is now Tamasic's second largest country of exposure behind Singapore. Uh, this is a slight reduction from last year's 27%. Given that the country is still virtually closed to the world with its strict COVID-19 measures, uh, what is Tamasic's view on investing in China moving forward? So look, so we've been investing in China for almost 20 years now and have invested through various cycles up and down. And China has been a very good market for us. I would say in the last decade, it's been uh, the best performing market for us across every region. Uh, and that includes the performance for the last 12 months. So we continue to be constructive on China. Um, I think we see a lot of opportunities alongside our four major trends, which is around digitization, sustainable living, longer lifespans, and changing nature of consumption in emerging markets. China fits in well into all of them. I would say uh, the only nuances we have to keep in mind today compared to, let's say, a couple of years ago, is one, we've got to make sure that whatever we're doing is aligned with policy. And secondly, given the polarization of the world, we've got to make sure that companies we're investing in are not caught in the crosshairs of US-China tensions. And what that means is we need to look at companies that have either China as a market and are reliant on technology within China. So they really operate within the China sphere of influence. And if you do that, we think there are a lot of opportunities and we'll continue to find attractive opportunities in China. And uh, just to round up our discussion today with the ongoing geopolitical uncertainties, rising inflation and supply chain disruptions, uh, Rohit, looking ahead to 2023, what is Tamasic's strategy in generating strong returns? So as I mentioned earlier, we look to invest alongside our long-term trends, which we think will transcend the next couple of years and hold us well for a resilient portfolio in the medium term. Um, Having said that, we do see the outlook as being, um, in terms of having slower economic growth, potentially a recession in the US and Europe. 
And if that happens, it will impact all markets globally. So we see further downside in the markets right now. Um, right now, the entire decline in markets you've seen in the US and Europe has really been a function of the rising rate environment. And I think the next shoe to fall will be once you see a decline in earnings being priced in. So for that reason, we are cautious in the near term and slowing our investment pace. But as I said earlier, we will continue to look for opportunities within our long-term secular trends. And where we find those opportunities at the right values, we will still invest. Rohit, thank you for your perspectives and your time today. Rohit Sipahi Malani, Tamasik's Chief Investment Officer and Head of Southeast Asia. About 1.5 million Singaporeans will receive up to $700 in cash next month as part of a $1.5 billion package to help them cope with high inflation. Eligible Singaporeans will receive two payments, one through the GSTV Cash and the other through the GSTV Cash Special Payment. Now you can check if you're eligible and the amount you will receive by logging in with your SingPass at this link. Japan today bid farewell to its former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who was assassinated in Western Japan's Nara City on Friday. Huge crowds gathered outside of Tokyo's Zojoji Temple and lined the procession route, paying their last respects and hoping to catch a glimpse of the hearse carrying Mr Abe's body. Many were seen waving and raising their arms in the air as the vehicle drive, drove past while others bowed their heads in respect. The procession travelled through the streets of Tokyo, passing by a number of significant buildings, including the Prime Minister's office and the Parliament building. The final stop was Tokyo's Kirigaya Funeral Hall, where the cremation took place. And here in Singapore, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong also paid his final respects to Mr Abe, accompanied by Madam Ho Ching, PM Lee signed the condolence book for Mr Abe at the residence of Ambassador Yamazuki Jun earlier today. Curious onlookers continue to flock to Sri Lankan President Gotabaya Rajapaksa's residence, resident, residence which was stormed by protesters over the weekend. Protesters say they will occupy the residence until the president steps down officially. The President and Prime Minister Ranil Wickram Singer have both offered resignations, with the President promising to quit on Wednesday. It's currently unclear if either man will deliver on their promise. Now, this is amidst a devastating economic meltdown, which the country unable to pay for even the most basic of daily needs. Earlier today, the embattled President was caught in a humiliating standoff with airport immigration staff as he attempted to flee the country. Rohini Mohan joins with more. She is our India correspondent who is closely following developments in Sri Lanka. Rohini, so what happens now that the President and PM have both indicated that they will be willing to resign? Who's likely to replace them and how soon will we see them coming to power? So when I've spoken to sources in Sri Lanka over the last few days and especially today, all of them kind of finished with a phrase after their description of events uh, that anything can happen now. Uh, things are very fluid. Uh, there are multiple reasons for different political ambitions to clash. Uh, constitutionally, the rule uh, of what would happen if a president resigns is that the prime minister takes over as acting president for 30 days till the parliament can elect another president. Uh, and this is the procedure. If both the president and the prime minister resign, the speaker takes over uh, as the president until another election happens. At this moment, everyone is playing the acting game. Uh, president Gotabaya Rajapaksa has said that he will resign. And uh, some news reports in Sri Lanka say that he has actually signed a resignation letter and given it to the speaker of the parliament, uh, who said he will announce it on Wednesday, July 13th. And at that point, the uh, beginning of uh, the new candidates vying for the post will begin. Uh, however, uh, this is not something that a lot of people in Sri Lanka are very certain about because uh, of the history of uh, Mr. Rajapaksa holding on and clinging to his seat. 
this is the same that applies to Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe as well, who is waiting to see if the prime minister if the president resigns and only then he says he will resign he says it is for the stability of uh, the sri lankan government uh, and sri lankan citizens who are uh, struggling under a massive uh, economic uh, downturn which has meant that they don't have food fuel medicines and he says that a stable government should be in place everyone is in agreement on that part of his statement but only if he resigns will a new uh, candidate be appointed uh, there are many names that are in the fray different political parties have suggested different names uh, however uh, it's actually a really telling moment uh, that none of these candidates really have a popular mandate. Uh, none of them are preferred by the larger public, which is extremely enraged since January, and especially since March when protests uh, have been widespread across the country. And they are tired of the same old political class and they want another neutral figure to be in power. But who this will be, uh, no one knows. So I can understand why so many of my sources said uh, anything can happen. Sri Lanka is facing an unprecedented economic crisis and people are demanding change. How will the new leaders pull the country out of this mess, Rohini? So if there is a consensus candidate and there is a new president and a new prime minister, uh, they will serve out the terms, uh, their terms until the end of uh, the uh, current president's term, which is 2024. So during this time, uh, any new government's first and urgent mandate, uh, first and urgent uh, agenda should be economic reform, immediate relief first to citizens who don't have fuel. Uh, petrol and diesel have just run out in Sri Lanka. And uh, India gave uh, a few credit lines for fuel, but those have also run out. Uh, and now, uh, before all of these resignations and the uh, kind of refreshed protests happened, uh, the government was trying to get uh, uh, subsidized petrol and diesel and oil from the Middle East, uh, from especially UAE and Qatar, but that has also been stalled. So new, the new government will have to put in place uh, structures that first uh, replenish the fuel supply, which is affecting everyday life and public transport is also going to come to a standstill soon. Uh, it, will, it has also caused huge power cuts across the country, except in Colombo, everywhere else there are long power cuts. Uh, and then secondly, to replenish the uh, foreign exchange reserves so that the government and the country can buy more medicines, more food, much of which is imported because Sri Lanka is an island country. Uh, and then thirdly, to put in economic reforms for the long term that undo some of the long term, some of the policies that have actually destroyed the economy. For example, huge indebtedness. Uh, Sri Lanka has depended for far too long on high interest loans from the, the global market. Uh, to undo this and uh, to also put in place uh, social security measures, pensions, uh, better salaries, for people who are in uh, who uh, who are working very hard every day but are now struggling at terrible inflation uh, and none of and their income is just not enough to put food on the table so this is a huge and daunting and understandably avoidable situation for any new government but this is actually what they will have to take on and any measures will be uh, not very popular, but will also be extremely important. If you have to be somebody with a, a thick skin, it will also have to be somebody who has public uh, support because uh, people are very angry right now and over the years. If if the solutions are not proper, some of the people who, are, uh, who have been watching this very closely said that there could be a social uprising things could get more violent uh, and people who are already angry and suffering uh, could just reach to a point of anarchy. Right now, they're still talking democratic solutions and if the new government doesn't do it, it could go, uh, it could become an extremely difficult situation to handle. Rohini Mohan there, our India correspondent who is closely following developments in Sri Lanka. Those are our top stories today. Don't forget to subscribe to us by hitting the red button below. I'm Harian Todiman. See you tomorrow for more stories on The Big Story.